this is a whole spring lamb ready to be roasted on a spit. But we're only doing part of it today, the saddle. We're doing Celadano Roti Persiade. We're doing roast saddle of lamb. Next time on The French Chef. <laughs> Here's a whole lamb, it's ready to be roasted on a spit. But we're not going to do the whole lamb today, we're just going to do the, a part of it. We're going to do a Celadano Roti Persiade. We're doing Roast Saddle of Lamb today on The French Chef. The French Chef is made possible by a grant from the Polaroid Corporation and a grant from Hills Brothers Coffee Incorporated. <laughs> Chef, I'm Julia Child. This is a saddle of lamb. And as you can see, it really, it looks like a saddle when you hold it up. And that's why they call it a saddle of lamb. And it's terribly easy to cook and serve. And if you're having a chic little dinner party for six to eight people, this is a great piece of meat to have. And it's wonderfully tender, as you can see. In the, these are these strips of meat that just run all the way down the length of it on either side. It's like a great giant loin chop. And as sometimes you might have a little trouble communicating with your butcher. I want to show ex you exactly where it comes from so you can tell him exactly what you want. And we have our friendly beef chart here. And I've particularly used the beef chart to point out to you that the bone structure is exactly the same on the beef as it is on the lamb. Of course, on the beef, it's a little larger. But it's the same principle. There's the neck and the shoulder and the backbone and the ribs and the loin. And this loin is what the saddle of lamb is. And sometimes the butcher calls it a stick, and he sometimes calls it a kidney loin. But he rarely calls it a saddle, because to a butcher, when they say a hind saddle, it means a whole hind quarter. So you have to point out to him what it is. And as you can see, there's your hip bone here. And the loin or saddle starts at the end of the hip bone and includes the 13th or floating rib. And I think the best thing to do is to show it, show on yourself, because you're made the same way. Say you want the whole double loin or the small of the back that runs right away around. And you want from the 13th rib to the hip bone. And I think if you say that, he will know exactly what you mean. And the loin, here's some loin chops. You're most familiar with that. That's the way the chop looks. And here it is. Uh, when it has not been cut and is connected to the loin. And as you'll remember, this is exactly like your T-bone steak or porter bone, bone steak because it comes from the loin. You have your little chop bone, which is a T shape. There's the top of the T. You have a large piece of meat on one side, which is the loin strip, and a small piece of meat on the other side, which is the filet or tenderloin. And so I think from this illustration, you will remember what the loin is. And this naturally needs trimming because you have the flanks hanging out. And you can ask the butcher to trim it for you, but I'm going to show you exactly what you do when it is trimmed so that you can tell the butcher what you want done. Now here, when you turn it upside down, you have these long pieces of strap which are called which are the kidneys and the kidney fat. And these, you just, he just pulls out. So you just yank them out. This is really extremely easy to do yourself. And maybe you could get a better price if you did your own trimming. And you have this sort of a reddish flap up at one end, which is the, the spleen. And that makes very good cat meat. And the kidney. See, it's all wrapped up in that piece of fat. And you just peel the fat off, and there's your little lamb kidney. And I imagine if you bought the whole loin and trimmed yourself, then you get the kidneys free, and it has this little membrane around it. And that's very nice to eat, too. 
And I'm going to put all of the fat scraps out. And then you want to trim off the inside fat from around. And you also have a 13th rib. And this, as you remember, this is the, the floating rib here. And you can probably see it right there, but you can certainly feel it with your hand. And also, if you want to get a slightly longer loin than this, you, can you could have some of the ribs included, two or three of them. This one, as it is untrimmed, weighs about six and a half pounds. And to get the rib out, you just take a sharp little knife and cut all around it. And if you've got, say, the more ribs attached, they're just very easily removed, just like that. When you get to the end, break it off. And there you are. And then take the one out on the other side. That's, you, when you bend it, you can feel it with your finger. You could also do the rack or the ribs exactly the same way. You just wouldn't have the tenderloin part, too. See there, that's just cutting around on either side of the bone and then just twisting and cutting it out. Actually, I think it's a good idea to learn to do some trimming yourself because then you get the meat exactly the way you'd like it to be. And then you have the problem of inside uh, fat and of the flank. And there's quite a lot of inside fat, and I think the thing to do is just to cut all of that out. You know, lots of people don't, I mean, some people don't like lamb very much, and I think it may be because they don't like the rather strong flavor of the fat. And particularly, this is a young lamb. This is a uh, genuine spring. But if you get la uh, the heavier lamb, you'll find that that has much more fat in it, and the fat is fairly strong. So tell your butcher, or do yourself, trim out all of this. You have to separate the meat a little bit and just pull out that fat. And you have some more on the other side. See, on this on the end of this strip of meat, there's quite a heavy coating of fat under there. That, I'm going to put on my glasses to see everything, you should just remove too. And then other, a little more fat on the top of your, of your filet strip. Sometimes you butchers don't have the time to do all of this, so if you happen to get this and it was all tied up, I would just untie it and then take out the fat and just be sure that it was out. I'm not going to take all of it out, but this gives you the idea of what you should do. And try not, I made two little holes there. It's not going to make too much difference because I didn't have my glasses on, but had I had them, I wouldn't have made those little holes. I'm just going to take that other extra little bit out. But you see that's very easily trimmed, and it's practically all done now. And then you have the, the next thing is you have this long flank here. And you remember when we did a flank steak, we, there's a piece of meat here, and that's part of the flank steak. Of course, it's very small on the lamb. And you want to trim that. But you want the flank to come over and cover the center part of the meat. So put it over to the center part so that you can mark it. And then just cut it off. In other words, it's about two and a half to three inches long on each side. And then the flank you can save and you can uh, put any kind of a, of a meat marinade on it and dry it off and broil it or you can put a mustard coating on it and broil it. Or you could well, be sure and take all the excess fat off of that, too, because the flank can, make, can also make very good eating. And that you would also get free if you got the whole piece yourself. <coughs> so there you have the underside all trimmed, and then you have the <coughs> top side. And I always, there is a skin on the top of the lamb, and I always ask the butcher to take that off because it's a little hard to get off. And then take a sharp knife and just score the, f 
score the fat on the top. And there should be only a one quarter inch layer of fat. So if there's more fat on the top, have it taken off or take it off. You don't want too much on, just enough. And now you want to season the inside of the meat with salt and pepper and some herbs. You're not going to season the outside at all, just the inside. That's probably about half a teaspoon of salt and then grind some fresh pepper on. And then you don't have to put in herbs if you like, but I'm going to put in some rosemary because I think rosemary goes beautifully with lamb and one doesn't often have an opportunity to use it. And it's a lovely herb. I probably have about a quarter of a teaspoon of rosemary on. And now you want to tie the meat so that, because you want the flanks to go over and protect this tender filet meat underside. And the filet, you see, there's your backbone that runs up. You can feel it with your finger. And on either side is this tenderloin, which is exactly like the tenderloin of beef, but on a much smaller scale. And that's the reason that you keep on this flank is that so when you turn the flank over it, it protects this tenderloin. And then you want to tie it up and have some white kitchen string and just make two or three ties just to hold that flank in place. Like in this case, this only needs about two ties. This is, uh, is spring lamb. The whole carcass doesn't weigh more than about 45 pounds, and it's very tender and nice. But if you've got a heavy lamb, you might find that when you ended up with a trimmed saddle that, you'd, that it would weigh uh, four and a half to six pounds. It just depends on the size of the animal. And now, you want to be sure before you roast it that it is at room temperature so that you can time it perfectly well. And then it goes into a roasting pan and get a roasting pan that will just hold it nicely because you don't want a great big roasting pan because if you do, the, uh, the, all the juices will burn. So you want one that will just hold it nicely. And remember that your meat is at room temperature. And then you want to put a thermometer in. And I think there, uh, these are one of the great inventions because if you've got a good thermometer, you can absolutely tell when it is done. And be sure that you get the thermometer right down into the center of the meat on one side. And then you want to butter the, butter the outside ends. I've got some melted butter here, which I'm just going to put into a little basting pan. And I have a little basting brush, and I'll butter each end of that of the exposed meat. And it isn't going to need any basting on the top, because you have the top fat. And you don't want to roast it in a rack. You just want it to sit, want it to sit flat in a pan. And then it goes into the oven. And have your oven preheated to 475 degrees, and set the pan right in the middle level, and that is to roast for 15 minutes. And this, I mean, this is browning for 15 minutes. And while it is browning at 475, you get some vegetables ready, which are going to go into the, into the roasting pan. I've got an onion here. And these are going to flavor the juices, and this makes all the difference. And we also have a carrot, and that just gets roughly chopped. And you don't even need to peel the carrot. And I have a large piece of garlic, and that's going to go in, and that isn't even peeled either. And then after your meat is browned for 15 minutes, turn the oven down to 400, and put the vegetables in and then baste the meat. I'll just pretend that that has started to brown and just put the vegetables in on either side. That's just sliced garlic, I mean sliced carrots and onions and one big piece of garlic. And then baste the ends of the meat again. And then you want to baste them, baste them and sort of stir the vegetables around about every 10 minutes. 
And now, this is your second part of your cooking. Your oven is down to 400 degrees and cook it, bake, roast it again for another, uh, another 15 minutes and then take a look at it. And if, if the vegetables seem to be browning too much, turn the oven down to 375. And you can count on a basic 45 minutes for any saddle because it isn't a thick piece of meat, as you could see, and the actual meat, is, it's, it's the length of it. And if it's a heavier animal, it's a little bit thicker. But um, after 45 minutes, look at the thermometer. And I think if you're not used to cooking, serving, and eating lamb, pink, sort of a pinky medium rare, I think you'll find it a new experience. I find that uh, 400, I mean, 140 degrees is ideal because the meat is nice and pink then and it's lovely and juicy. A larger saddle might take, um, might take about an hour, but I think this one, which is three and a half pounds, takes about 45 minutes to 140. And now a nice covering on this is, will be a persillade, and all that a persillade is is just parsley and breadcrumbs. And I'm going to put a little bit of, of chopped shallot or scallion in, and about three big spoonfuls of melted butter. And then we're going to, the breadcrumbs are going to cook in it. I think the little chopped shallot, about two tablespoons, makes a very, a very nice bit of flavor with it. And then some fresh white breadcrumbs, about a cup. This is just like cooking croutons, which we've done many times. And you just want to let those cook over moderate heat until the breadcrumbs are nicely browned like this. And you have to keep, keep right at them and, and don't let them burn up. And then after your breadcrumbs are brown, you season it with salt and pepper, a little bit of salt. There's nothing, nothing on that with a little bit of pepper and just a little sprinkling of salt. There's nothing worse than breadcrumbs with no seasoning on them. And then here's the, the persil part of your persillade. That's about a quarter of a cup of chopped parsley. And then just, you can do that all ahead of time and shake it up and it's ready for you when you're ready for it. And then when your meat is done, being sure that you have looked at it uh, after 45 minutes and have basted it, then you want to let it rest before you carve it. So I have one here that's all done. But as soon as you see that it's at 145, open the oven door, pull it out a little bit, and let it rest with the oven off for about 20 minutes before you carve it. Because you want to be sure that the juices go back into the meat, because it's terrible to carve the meat and have the juices all fall out of it. And then you put your, after this 20 minutes, you're ready to carve it, and you put it onto a carving board. Take out your thermometer and remove your trussing strings. This is, this is a larger saddle. This is about, this is about a four pound one, and it had two extra ribs besides the 13, which made it a little bit, a little bit longer. And now you have all of these nice roasting juices in your, in your roasting pan, and you're just going to make a little sauce for these. And see, the vegetables have all browned nicely. And skim out any extra fat. You want to leave a little tiny bit of fat in because it gives some flavor, about a spoonful. And then you want to add a little more flavor to it because that's really not enough juice. So put in some white wine. I always use dry white vermouth. And this is overheat. And then if you have a little homemade stock, that would be nice. But if you don't, just use some canned beef bouillon. And you, if you want a little tiny bit of thickening, put in a little bit of tomato paste. That's just about a teaspoonful. And that will slightly thicken the sauce and also give it a little more color. And squish it all around and mash down the vegetables. There's your garlic being mashed down. 
And then you just want to let this simmer for, oh, 10 or 15 minutes. You could let, you could remove your lamb to another pan and let your sauce be simmering while you're letting your lamb cool off. And then you're ready to carve your meat. And I'm going to get a side dish here. You can carve it either in the dining room, if you have somebody who's a good carver, you can carve it in the kitchen and reassemble it. And I'm <clears throat> I want to carve it here for you because I want you to see exactly how it's done. And the only thing that you have in here is your backbone. So the first thing you do is to slice down the backbone on either side. And there are two methods of carving it. There's the first one, which is done quite a bit in restaurants, which is to slice horizontal slices along the length of the backbone. And the first slice takes off your outside covering of meat. And be sure that you have a long, sharp knife. And these just make long, horizontal slices. And when you slice them, be sure that you Keep the slices in the order in which you in the order in which you carve them. Now you have we have the the tenderloin underneath, which I could have taken off first because I was in the kitchen. But if you're in the dining room carving it, you after you had sliced all of your meat off, you would then take the tenderloin off. So I'll take that off second. I'll take that, that off after I've carved some of this meat. I'm just going to carve some to give you an idea of how it goes. And be sure that you have kept these slices of meat in the order in which you carve them. I'm move this over a little bit. Now I'm going to do the underneath part. Say that you could slice both of the both sides that way. Then take off your, remove your flank, and then slice the fillets underneath. And keep the flank aside, and then just cut down on either side, and you get this filet or tenderloin. So they're just two little narrow strips. So there are your narrow, narrow little fillets. And these you would cut into small pieces so that each person would get one. And then put these on a hot side dish. I really think it's much easier to carve these in the kitchen, because you'll see when we reassemble it again that it looks very nice. But this really all depends on the master of the house. And if he loves to carve, it's a sort of a nice show-off piece. Now I'm going to show you the second method of how to carve, how to carve the loin strip, or the top meat. This is a a French method, which I rather like, and this is to remove this whole, whole loin strip, and then cut it into, cut it crosswise. And this would be just as though this were the chopped meat. And then again, be sure that you keep the slices in the order in which you slice them, because you're going to reassemble them again. I'm not going to carve all of those either. These are in about an inch or three quarter inch slices. And then you are ready to reassemble and have a warm platter. And then, as you remember, we saved the flanks. And that was so that you're going to put the, put the bone back on the platter again. And this is to steady the, to steady this bone. And then 
reassemble as you, main thing is which way did I start? Oh, there I am. Reassemble the slices the way you put them on. And this lovely pink meat is just, is delicious and tender. And then here goes the And then there goes the ones that were sliced sausage way. I have these plates in one of those folding plate warmers, uh, these dishes, and it really is very nice because it keep, really keeps them warm. Now the flank, which is underneath, these I'm putting the filet pieces around now, and the flank, which was underneath, you can serve as second helpings. And you want to try and carve very, very fast because you want to keep the meat warm. And if by any chance you've carved slowly, uh, just stick the meat in the, in the oven for just a moment. And then you have, and then everything is nice and warm, so you put your sauce over it. And this sauce you would have, you would have strained out. I'm just spooning some of these juices over, and then the rest of it you would serve in a warm serving bowl. But you always want some of the juices over the meat because right after it's carved, because it makes it look very nice. And it also gives it a little more flavor. And then you have your persillade, which goes on top. You can see that why you want the persillade, because it, it dresses it up. And it also, again, gives it a lovely flavor. And that just gets sprinkled on top. And if you were going to carve it at the table, you'd put the persillade just on top of the whole saddle and just bring it in with the persillade on. But I think it's very attractive that way. But remember, with this, to do a little carving practice first so that you can carve very, very quickly, because it's terrible to serve meat that isn't that isn't really nice and warm. And then as soon as it's all carved and ready, take it into the dining room and gobble it up. There. Now I'm going to serve you some so you can see how nicely it goes. And here I'm doing a long strip here so everyone gets a long piece of meat. And then one of the little pieces of filet and a little bit of the strained juices on top. And then uh, for vegetables, what could be nicer than pum anna, or the sliced potatoes baked in butter in the form of a cake, and braised on dive, and whole baked tomatoes. That really makes a perfectly delicious and very chic dinner. And with this, you want to serve your very best chateau bottled red Bordeaux midoc. And that goes beautifully with it. Now, of course, a, a saddle is, is not a budget cut of meat. It's for good, uh, it's for when you're having wonderful company. But it's so delicious and it's light. It's just, it's just a really a giant, a giant loin chop. And if you cook it, be sure that you cook it until it's just to 140 degrees, that tender pink. And it's, it's a wonderful, entertaining dish. And, well, I guess that's all for today on The French Chef. This is Julia Child. Bon appétit. The French Chef has been made possible by a grant from Hills Brothers Coffee Incorporated and a grant from the Polaroid Corporation. Julia Child is co-author of the book, Mastering the Art of French Cooking.